Hi, Misfits. This is Kate. And this is Kevin. Welcome to Horrorwood. nothing to say there I don't know what I was going with oh, I gotta bring up my notes <laughs> there they are okay I like that Kate you're just Thank like you. just give me a sec just I need a moment I need a minute I have some drainage happening uh, in my I think we region. all do like it's my sinuses are so dry right now Ooh. and you know how you can like feel it when you move your yeah nose yeah and you, yep. it's just bleh. Yeah, I woke up in like my ears and my nose and my head and my everything. So apologies, everyone. I might pause in the middle of this to go blow my nose. Weird. I don't know why I thought of this, but I just watched a scary movie last night. Shocker. Tell me about it. So, you know, this actually made it to theaters recently and people were saying to go see it instead of the new Exorcist movie if you wanted a good possession movie. Oh, okay. Um. I don't get me wrong. Love the Exorcist right, right. believer. You've heard my talk. I have my speech. <laughs> That's uh, my TED talk. So I that would be an amazing TED talk. <laughs> Why this movie is amazing? Um, you should do it. I would love that. So it's called Where When Evil Lurks. I think. I or think Where I've Evil Lurks. Heard of that? Um, it's on Shutter. It's from Argentina. Ooh. And it's this. It's the director. It's a director who did a movie called Terrified, which sort of got a cult following and is really good. Okay. It's on Shutter if you get a chance. It's about this rural town in Argentina, and something's happening with one of the neighbors, and they're they're talking about being possessed. Like this guy at this other house is possessed by. What do they even call it? A rotten. Like they say he's a rotten. Oh, okay. Um, and it's all about if you shoot the evil or if you kill the evil, the possessed one, uh, it just jumps and it possesses someone else. Oh, I see. So it's kind of like a virus. Like yeah. It, ke- it like ke- keeps moving to different things and different people. And it's these two brothers in this rural town who are like trying to stop it because how you how they brought this up is the guy that's possessed is like laying in this bed and he's just like inflated with like pus Ew. and he's like giant and like, like gross. gross and when you were talking about the drainage and waking up feeling like full of crap that's <laughs> what made me pus. think of <laughs> that's what it made me think of but it was really fucking good and it was really dark all right uh, Sorry, that was a long thing. Go ahead. I might cut it. I'm not all not all of it. I might like <laughs> <laughs> I might just Kate's like fuck that. <laughs> Shut up. Delete that whole Delete. conversation. <laughs> um no. But uh you know what I'm definitely not gonna cut? The fact that a lot of you out there are giving us ratings oh like good ones and thank you. Thank you so much. Our rating on Spotify went up. A tenth of a point. That's, I mean. You know what? We'll take take it. it. We love it. Thank you so much. We're moving in the right direction. Even one, like, one good review is, in my book, really amazing. Oh, absolutely. I cherish them all. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we have a new Patronian. (gasps) PT. We got to shout them out. James Harrington. Hey, James Harrington. This is your shout out. Shout out. Thank you so much. We totally appreciate your support. We seriously, seriously yes. could not keep this thing going without all of you. So thank you so much, James Harrington. I don't know. I why. love the way you did that, Kate. <laughs> That's it. Kate also did a little dance with it. James. I did. So, you didn't get to see it, yeah. but <laughs> trust me, it was. We're going to choreograph a dance for. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, we might. We might. <laughs> When I was in college, I took a ballet class and I did my final dance number. I had to choreograph it with a friend of mine, Christine, who was also in the class. Uh-huh. And we did it to Anna Nolix, breathe, parentheses, 2 a.m. And I got a C minus. <gasps> Why? Because it wasn't really ballet. Oh, <laughs> it just wasn't the assignment whatsoever. <laughs> well, I mean, ballet is really hard. How am I supposed to dance? <laughs> I just did kind of modern and swayed my arms a lot there and looked go. everyone in the eyes. <laughs> that was so creepy the way you did that. You know what wasn't creepy though? What? 
Halloween. It was so fun. <gasps> Halloween was amazing. It so we did have a bit of a snowstorm. Holy shit. In Chicago, which was wild. But you know what? It did not keep those trick or treaters away. I'm glad it didn't. Yeah. If you're in the Chicago and you you should probably expect things like that. The best costume, I think I told you about it, was a little girl dressed as a crazy cat lady. Oh my goodness. I know she's not listening because she's like seven, but that girl was phenomenal. She had her hair in rollers. Future listener. A big like house coat on that had all these stuffed animal cats all over. It was amazing. That's precious. She was, she was awesome. So yeah, I hope all of you had a great Halloween. And I wanted to say that we recorded our Halloween episode, the Candyman episode, a few days before Halloween. Mm-hmm. And I try, I made a decision a while ago to not talk about current events necessarily because a lot of times we're recording, you know, that by the time that the recording comes out, those events are in the past. Right. But there are a couple of things I just wanted to mention. There were a slew of mass shootings over Halloween weekend, (sighs) which. Unfortunately, it's not surprising, but we just wanted to acknowledge that. I mean, that's like the real horror of Halloween. And I don't mean to say that as a joke. Right, right. Like, and it's it's so crazy, like, that this is our reality constantly and we're almost desensitized to it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I, it makes me sick, honestly. And it's a very American problem because America oh my God, loves its guns. So, like, in other countries, honestly, other countries, like, laugh at us they're like what the hell are you guys doing over there and we we know we understand no i mean we're not i mean it's not like we're oblivious to the problem like it's it's scary that you know you you leave your house and don't know what danger you're gonna face that day it's at the hands of an assault rifle or something ridiculous that people are allowed to have i think I love what New Zealand did a few years ago. The prime minister, like, I believe after a shooting, she outlawed all guns and made everyone turn Which is what America needs to do. Just fucking do it. We we don't need guns. And it's just, I mean, it's because it's all tied up in money and legislation. Of course. And it's like... It's a political game. It's disgusting. That's the thing America loves. It's guns. They love arguing about their guns. They love using guns as, like, leverage for political debates. And I hate when people say, like, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Guess what? Guns kill people. Right. And people with guns kill, kill people. people. Sorry, I went on like a little soapbox, but... No, Kate, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just to the point where this is happening weekly, daily, everywhere. Everywhere. And, All the time. And there, no one's doing anything. Nope. No and, one's doing anything. And they won't. That's the thing. The, the one other thing I wanted to bring up, which... Ugh, I mean, I know everyone's talking about yeah. it. It's all over social media. Matthew Perry. Oh, oh my man. God. I... I, I think I'm still in shock. Yeah. And, you know, they they rerun Friends every night. I can't remember what station it's on, but it's always on at night. And I would sometimes turn it on to that just like as I'm settling down into the evening to kind of chill things out. And I have not been able to bring myself to watch to it watching. because it's too sad. That's harsh. What a loss. He was so ta- such a talented performer. And oh, actor. my God. And I mean, I was a kid when that show started. Yeah. I was an adult when it, when ended. it ended. Yeah. I've seen every single episode a gajillion times before streaming. Mm-hmm. I had the entire series on DVD and I watched oh, it a lot. So, yeah, I used to I had it in college with me and mm-hmm. I would just put in a DVD and that was kind of what helped me fall asleep. It was just like a comfort. I love that. I did that with the Sex in the City pink book. Oh, I definitely had the Sex in the City on DVD mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, it's just uh, it's so heartbreaking yeah. and There's nothing I can say that hasn't already been said, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Also, I didn't realize until he passed that Keith Morrison was his stepdad. Uh, Did you not see that? No. Holy shit. I had no Uh. idea. So, of course, like they've been showing a lot of Keith Morrison and it's wild. I had no idea that like the godfather of true True crime crime. was Matthew Perry's stepdad. Wild. That is crazy. Uh, so those are just the topics I wanted to briefly mention today before we dive into this case. Well, damn. And originally I was going to make this a one-parter and I'm so sorry. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be a two-parter. 
if we're able, we'll try to get part two out later this week. Mm-hmm. So you're not waiting until next Monday, but I can't make any promises because mm-hmm. there's been a lot going on here. Hey, it's a busy time. Before we begin, I want to give a massive shout out to Anthony Wayne. He writes a blog called Crime Blogger 1983. It's on crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. We'll link it, so don't worry if you didn't catch that. Uh, he also writes on Medium under the name Sherlock Holmes, but he spells Sherlock S-H-U-R instead of (laughs) S-H-E-R. And my computer really hated that. So I'm just going to reference him as Anthony Wayne. He did a deep dive into this case several years ago. And I was able to access a lot of news articles because he had found them already and provided links on his site. So I'll link his blog for sure. A lot of those articles can also be found on newspapers.com. He was a guest on the Unfound podcast back in 2017 talking about this case. So I'll link that episode as oh, great. well. This case is wild. I actually, I originally picked it because I was like, oh, this is a nice contained case that I can crank out because there's been a lot going on here. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a ton of time. And then the more I dug into it, I was like, well, damn. Oh, shit. So two-parter. I'm ready. All right. July 6, 1983 was a Wednesday. 18-year-old Tammy Lynn Leppert was waiting for a friend to pick her up from her home in Rockledge, Florida. They had plans to go to Cocoa Beach. She was dressed in a blue jean skirt, a light blue shirt with white flower appliques on the shoulders, Mm. and flip-flops. And she carried a gray purse. When her friend Keith Roberts pulled up to her home, Tammy said to her mom, Bye, Mommy. I'll see you in a bit, okay? Tammy's mom, Linda Curtis, noticed her daughter had not combed her hair before leaving, which was unusual because, according to Linda, Tammy was very particular about her appearance, Mm. always wanting to look her best when she was going out. Mm -hmm. Because Tammy wasn't just your average teen spending the summer eating pizza rolls and watching TV on the couch. Oh, I want some Totinos. Oh, so good. Tammy was a rising star, a model, actress, and literal beauty queen She'd been competing in and winning pageants since she was just four years old. I feel like you have some thoughts on that. I mean, no, I mean, I just, you know, whenever I hear child pageantry, I think yeah. of like that TLC show, Toddlers yep, and Tiaras. Yep, that's exactly what I thought And about. I always wanted those little fake snap-in white teeth. Wait, what? Oh, Kate, yeah, their teeth are not real. Stop. They have like those, they're like these little snap-in plastic or porcelain <sighs> things. That you pop over your teeth and they're just like bright white. They're like veneers for toddlers. Yeah. Seriously? (laughs) I did not know this. I don't think I'm making that up. Do they make them for adults? Serious question. I mean, like, I don't know. I think you and I should get some pop in white teeth. I would I could love use that. Them. Me too. <laughs> These old corn kernels are crumbling. Corn kernels. <laughs> So Tammy had also recently completed a couple of small roles in films, one in the movie Spring Break, which was about college kids on spring Uh. break, and a bit part in a little movie called Scarface. Holy shit. Yep. I've never seen it. Okay, not going to lie, neither have I. I've seen parts of it. We should watch it. But I've never seen the whole thing, like, all the way through start to finish. Tammy had her sights set on Hollywood. And in Brevard County, Florida, where she grew up, she was considered high profile, a big fish in a small pond. Oh, I love that. Which is why it really stuck out to Linda that her daughter had not combed her hair before leaving that day. Yeah, that is strange. Yeah. Tammy and Keith drove to Cocoa Beach about half an hour away from her ho- from her house. She loved Cocoa Beach. It was one of her favorite places. Keith stated that Tammy had asked to borrow $300, which he gave to her. That's a chunk of change. It's a lot of money, especially back in 1983. Was it just to go to the beach? Unclear. Okay. And Keith also said that Tammy tried to convince him to take her all the way to Fort Lauderdale to see a friend. He refused to do it, saying he didn't have the time because Fort Lauderdale was two hours away from Rockledge, where, ah, they were, where they were. That's crazy. He was like, absolutely not. That's too far away. That wasn't the plan. He said, why don't I just take you back home? Yeah. His refusal to drive her to Fort Lauderdale really upset her. They got into an argument, and according to Keith, at that point, Tammy said, let me out, let me out. She just wanted out of the car. So he was like, all right, whatever you want. 
He dropped her off in a parking lot in Cocoa Beach, and Tammy Lynn Leppert was never seen never or seen heard again. from again. Mm-hmm. Fuck. That's, this all seems really weird and kind of shady. It's very weird. Everyone in it is kind of shady. Uh, We're going to go into I some mean, background. We are in Florida. Okay, I didn't want to say it, but since you did, I'm yeah, there is a lot of stuff going on. The penis of America is oh. what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All of That's our, a joke from 30 Rock. All That's of our Florida joke. listeners just turned no, off the no, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, there are some great people in Florida, mostly around the Disney area. But <laughs> I bet you've localized it to a specific part. I'm kidding. Have you been to Florida, Kate? Do you yes, ever go? I, have. I mean, I don't go. You don't just go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't just like hop on a plane and go. Kate's like, I'm going to Florida. Florida. <laughs> and I say it just like that. Florida. I went when I was a kid. So I went yeah. to Disney. And then when I was like in high school, my school went down there for a trip. But that's really it. My grandparents would always spend the summers, or sorry, the winters in Daytona Beach. Oh, okay. um, Which was cool. And they were racing fans. And we would go to Disney. And uh, my ex-boyfriend and I also went to Clearwater for a week once. Okay. Uh, which was really beautiful. We both got really sunburned, though. So their That's trip got where you ruined. got the sunburn? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh. And he got sunburned on the back of his legs so bad he couldn't walk. Oh, that's so we, awful. we had a nice, like, one or two days, and then we were both just yelling at each other because <laughs> we were in pain. Oh, no. Wear your sunscreen, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so as I was mentioning, I picked this case because I thought it was going to be pretty straightforward. But then the more I read into it, the more I was like, what? Mm. Nothing. I should know that nothing is straightforward Ever. in true crime <laughs> or <Ever>. in life. <laughs> That's a lie they tell you. Nothing is ever easy. Nothing is ever free. It's tough to know who to believe in this case. There are a lot of characters here. So let's start from the beginning. Mm. Okay. Tammy Lynn Leppert was born in Brevard County, Florida on February 5th, 1965. Her father's identity is unknown. And Tammy took the surname of her stepdad. She had four half siblings, Debbie, Rick, and... Suzanne and Bonnie, and I believe Suzanne and Bonnie are twins. Oh, wow. Not a ton is known about the siblings, but we will talk about Debbie and Suzanne a little bit later. Mm -hmm. According to her mom, Linda, Tammy had been a hyperactive child. So to channel that energy, she enrolled her in pageants beginning at the age of four. Linda had also been a contestant in pageants when she was younger, Mm. and she felt they were a great way to develop self-confidence and a strong sense of values and good sportsmanship. So she thought it would be a good outlet for Tammy. Did Tammy like it? It seems that she did. It just, you know, in that world, it always feels sometimes like the mom is kind of projecting onto the daughter. Well, we're going to see a lot of that. Uh, And also at four years old, I don't really know that you can make your own decision. I don't know that you can make a decision like that. Yeah. Yeah. Even at like 12, my mom made me be in Oliver, the musical, at the community theater. Granted, I ended up loving it. Okay. But at first, I was like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Well, Linda estimated that Tammy competed in around... 400 pageants. Oh, that's a lot. During her childhood. She won almost 300 of them. Uh, with titles like Little Miss Florida and Little Miss Talent. Little Miss Alligator. <laughs> Little Miss Alligator. Little Miss Swamp. <laughs> I'm making that. You should. In an article by Billy Cox for a local paper titled Florida Today, Tammy said of her pageant days, quote, I always liked showing off in front of people. When I was a little girl, the reason I liked to do pageants was because I enjoyed dressing up. So it seems like maybe she did like it. But again, it's also kind of all she knew from a very young age. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to really know about that. And despite having four other children, Linda seemed closest to Tammy. Tammy's career became her life. And essentially her livelihood. Wow. She sewed all of Tammy's costumes, chauffeured her around to all of the competitions, and was basically her momager. Chris Jenner before Chris Jenner. Uh, so, she, so we have a child as the breadwinner? Yes. Okay. And then we have our stage mom extraordinary. Oh no, Kate. These things don't end well. They never do. When Tammy was seven, her stepdad, Linda's husband, had had enough. He was tired of Linda and Tammy always being away at some competition because they were constantly traveling all over the state. The schedule was relentless. He said to Linda, look, it's her pageant career or me. Oh, shit. And this is according to Linda. 
Linda said she left it up to Tammy to decide whether she wanted to continue competing or not. And it's unclear if Tammy knew about the ultimatum. I would hope not. I would hope not. Because that's a lot of pressure to put on a seven-year-old. And yeah, like parents don't put your shit onto your kids. Yeah. As somebody who's dealing with that right now in therapy, it fucks you up. It does. (laughs) If she did know about this ultimatum, it's basically like she's being asked, do you want to keep doing this thing that you love or do you want to have a dad? Like, that is what they're (laughs) basically saying. I'm sorry to laugh, but, like, that's fucked. This whole story is fucked. Mm. Tammy told her mom she did want to continue. Linda and her husband divorced. He moved out, taking the son he shared with Linda with him. As far as Tammy's half-siblings go, it seems that there were times in her life where she did live with some of them. Mm -hmm. Her older sister, Debbie, and her younger brother, Rick, specifically, but eventually it wound up just being Linda and Tammy. She, like, kind of isolated her from the rest of her family a little bit. Yep. Yo. I mean, I don't know why I said yo. I meant to say yikes. (laughs) Yikes. When she was 10 years old, she competed in another pageant where she was crowned Queen of the Earth. That sounds like that was put on by a cult. I'm going to leave that one alone. And then after, the queen will lead us behind the (laughs) comet. So wrong. You would think that if you're 10 and you compete in a pageant winning the title Queen of the Earth, (laughs) that that might go to your head. Oh, shit. (laughs) But from everything I read, Tammy stayed down to earth. Oh, good, 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 good. She was always kind and outgoing. No one had a bad thing to say about her. Like in this entire story, all of my research I did, Mm -hmm. they talk about how kind she was, how bubbly she was, very poised. No one said anything bad about her. On the episode of the Unfound podcast, I mentioned at the start of this, Anthony Wayne describes a time when Tammy was in a pageant competition, and when it came time to announce the winner, the host accidentally called the name of another little girl, and so that little girl was crowned. And it wasn't until sometime after the fact (sighs) that the organization called and let Tammy know that she had actually won. Was Steve Harvey the host? It was the pre-Steve Harvey. (laughs) So Tammy said... Let her keep the crown because she saw how happy that little girl was when she thought she'd won. And so Tammy was like, just let her be the winner. Well, that was nice of Tammy, but that's also fucked up on the part of the pageant. Sure. but Like, it, it, I don't get this whole, like, calling the wrong name shit. Like, it just happens so much. Like, it's remember weird. La La Land and Moonlight? Oh, yeah. Fuck. We I hated La La that. Land. Uh, oh, we should. That might be a fun Patreon episode. Yeah, I like it. But that just kind of gives you an idea of the kind of person Tammy was. Mm -hmm. Competing in pageants opened a lot of doors for her. Directors and talent scouts would attend, and soon she started booking acting jobs in local commercials. She loved acting, stating once that it's what kept her breathing. So, whoa. (laughs) She even used acting as her talent in pageants. Because whereas a lot of kids play an instrument or they sing or whatever, no one was really busting out a monologue what would be your talent in a talent show kate that's a good question i'm really good at eating nutella biscuits i've seen you do that you are thank you and i'm great at sitting on the couch with my dog in my lap okay i would love to see you for five minutes sit on a stage on a couch with a doggy eating biscuits. And that's just it. That's it. I think we need to expand what talent means. Thank you. It's, it would be like an interp- uh What are those called? Like an interpretive. Interpretive dance? But not a, but not a dance. Mm. Like a modern art exhibit. Oh, like, oh, yeah. It would be a... I know what you're talking about. Like, like a, the woman who stared at people yeah, across the table. Marina Abramovic. Yes. Um, oh, why can't I think... I mean, like an immersive like art piece. Yeah. I know that there is a name for it. I can't. My, that's what my degree is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. <laughs> what would be your talent? Ooh, I think I would just get up there and uh, make up a song on the spot. I think you'd be good at that. Yeah, I would be like, I'm going to go to the mall and we're going to buy some clothes and I don't want to fall because it'll hurt my knees. And your toes. And my toes. If you want to rhyme. Hey, hey, hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it turns into a rap. And then I would, I'd do Zumba. <gasps> yes, yeah, I would do Zumba. That's it. That's, that's it. it. So Tammy found that the talent competition was where she could kind of be different and stand out with acting. Yes. 
And so her go-to piece was as the character Peter Pan in the scene where Tinkerbell is dying. And she has to, I don't know why you're laughing, but now I'm laughing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, every time I think of Peter Pan, I just think of like all those pe- those really like not great theater companies that decide to use a fly system. And then they just slam the actor <laughs> into a wall. It happens all the time. Oh, shit. Uh, I don't think she flew. I think this is the scene where like she's clapping and trying to get the audience like clap to get. Oh, to, to get Tinkerbell to come back to life. Yeah. So apparently with this piece, she really was able to shine. And her mom said that every time she performed it, she won the competition. And that's both national and state competitions, according to Linda. You know, actually, I changed my talent. It would be uh, showcasing a stage accident as Peter Pan. Like I would fly in and then they would smack me into a wall and then everyone would be like, oh, and I would pretend to be knocked out. And then I would come to life and be like, I'm okay. And as then like a you start trickle. doing Zumba. And then we do Zumba as yeah. Peter Pan. Yeah. Kate. That's it. Kate, we figured it out. And I'll just be over there on the couch. As a child, a local paper even named Tammy Brevard's answer to Shirley Temple. At just 13 years old, she was on the cover of CoverGirl magazine. And that same year, according to her mom, she was going to have a perfume named after her. What? We went from local pageantry to uh, national magazine. Here we are. Not only that, Linda told the Orlando Sentinel that Tammy would soon be auditioning for a movie role in Atlanta and was already the star of a film called Cover Girl Behind the Scenes, where she would be playing herself. Like kind of like a because she'd gotten the cover of that magazine, like they were going to showcase her getting ready for that, I guess. Linda said, quote, she was cast by Beverly McDermott, who's well known in the industry for movies and a TV series called Careers. It's supposed to start filming within the next six months. Things seemed to just keep getting better and better for Tammy. And in turn, things got better for her mom, Linda, as well. Linda was Tammy's agent, advisor, and mm, acting coach, all rolled into one. one. So much. Be a mama. Be a mom. That's the thing. And thanks to Tammy's success, she was able to open her own modeling company called Galaxy Model Workshop. It was also known as Galaxy Productions. I'm picturing her mom as like an Abby Abby Lee Miller type. Okay, the fact that you said that because I'm going to post a picture and you're not far off. Local newspapers stated Linda had a talent for turning kids, both male and female, into stars. Tammy was certainly one, at least in Brevard County, Florida. Because of Tammy's burgeoning success, it was becoming harder and harder for her to focus on school, obviously, because she's spending all her time traveling all over the place. She was traveling so much for the pageants and for these auditions that she would have to take her schoolwork with her on the road. And eventually... Upon entering high school, Linda withdrew her from from public school, stating she'd be getting... I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because I can't fucking That's see. Okay. <laughs> okay, there also, we go. I'm sorry if I'm just getting like a... I feel like I'm getting whiffs of my feet. Oh, I don't smell them. Good. I'm really glad because I'm like, ooh, I smell like farts. I am sitting next to a pile of Matt's shoes, so we're even. <laughs> So upon entering high school, Linda withdrew Tammy from public school, stating she'd be attending a local private school. I'm not sure how that makes any difference in the amount of schoolwork you need to get done. Wouldn't you have, like, I would imagine more schoolwork in a private school? I don't know. I guess I don't know enough about private schools. But that was their answer to Tammy's missing so much school. However, at age 16... She was exempt from going to high school by taking the GED test instead, which I can only assume she passed. That's an option? If she was, in fact, exempt from going to school. Can you go just get a GED instead of going to high school? Well, I looked this up, and I think there are some, what are they called, stipulations or or like conditions. Like if you are doing something that prevents you from attending, which I guess if she is... You know, she can prove that this is her livelihood. Maybe that was... Yeah. Or maybe it's a Florida thing. It could be a Florida thing. I mean, I would have loved to have just gone straight to the GED (laughs) and fuck all that four years of shit. So I want to go back just a bit. Mm -hmm. In the article likening her to Shirley Temple, which appeared in the Orlando Sentinel on February 9th, 1975. Thank you, Anthony Wayne, for the link. Mm. Writer Jeff Coonerth inexplicably... Prince Tammy Lynn's address. Uh, 
which maybe newspapers were just <laughs> wilding out in the 70s and telling the public where little kids lived. Maybe it's Tammy. Florida. I don't know. And address, phone number, email. Oh, was, there was an email. Yeah, but, there was an email. But that's so weird, right? That's I don't like that. So I looked up the address, obviously. Oh, <laughs> Google Maps. <laughs> it's on Merritt Island, which isn't an island at all, but rather a peninsula. Mm-hmm. Okay, Florida. And that address is a manufactured housing community, more commonly referred to as a mobile home or trailer park. Oh, okay. So no shade on mobile homes. No. But it's just not what I expected to find, given how successful it seemed Tammy and her mother had become. Which made me think, there's more going on behind all the pageantry, pun intended. Random offshoot. I've always thought, because the housing market is so ridiculous and shitty, Mm -hmm. I would actually consider like getting a mobile home or a tiny home. I've thought about tiny and homes. like just putting it on a little plot in a place and having a house. Putting on a plot in a place and a plot in a place and <laughs> a house, and then we're set. I think it's safe to say that all mother and daughter relationships are complicated, uh, especially when that daughter is going through puberty and wow. adolescence, and then when you add stage mom into the mix, and that mom is relying on her daughter's success for her own livelihood. Things get messy. Tammy, as I've mentioned or I think I've mentioned, was mm-hmm. Linda's only source of income. Yes. Even though she had this modeling company. Yeah, that's weird because you think she'd be making money off all those other kids. Mm-hmm, you would think. And I do think that was bringing in some money, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it wasn't because those kids were successful and she was getting like a manager's fee. So she wasn't doing a good job. Mm, not so much. Because she was very focused on, on Tammy. Tammy. Linda said she was a firm believer in pageants because they could open doors, telling Helene DeGroot of the Orlando Sentinel, quote, they've become our whole life just like Tammy is my whole life. Oh, no, Kate. Linda, girl, are you forgetting that you have four other kids? Linda, get a life. Uh... She's dead. (gasps) Sorry. Oh, no. Well, at that time, she should have got it. Get it. Get get a. Oh, no. (laughs) I'm going to stop talking. Kevin, speechless. Please continue. Like I mentioned earlier, although some of the other kids did live with Tammy and Linda at one point, it eventually became just the two of them. One of Tammy's sisters, Suzanne, was adopted out and never even met Tammy. I can only assume it was the same for Suzanne, for Suzanne's twin, Bonnie, though I can't confirm that. But Tammy's older sister, Debbie, who's technically her, sa- her half-sister, half sister, right? Did live with Linda and Tammy for some time, and so Debbie, who was four years older than Tammy, witnessed a lot. According to Debbie, Tammy and Linda used to fight a lot. During one of these fights, Linda threw a butter knife across the room at Tammy. Debbie also said that Linda herself had a rough childhood, so it seems the pattern of abuse was repeating. It it does repeat. That sounds like I, Tanya. Do you remember? Oh, that was a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like that relationship, that Mm -hmm. mother-daughter. I got you. Yeah. Debbie's also quick to say that she loved her mom and that her mom loved her kids, but just didn't know how to show it. That's tough. Yeah. Oh, man. And then, of course, Tammy is, like, wrapped up in her so hard. Oh, yeah. Yikes. I don't love it. Debbie also told Anthony Wayne, a.k.a. Crime Blogger 1983, a.k.a. Sherlock Holmes, Mm. that at one point... Tammy was supposed to attend a party with a friend. And it sounds like it was a work-related party, by the way she says supposed to attend. Tammy arrived with the friend. And when she got there, it became pretty clear that the men at this party expected sexual favors Ew, from Tammy and her no. friend. And Tammy was likely still a minor at this point, though we don't have an actual a date for when this occurred. Tammy was, of course, disgusted and upset and called her mom. She was like, Mom, you're not going to believe this. These guys want me to do these things. Like, what? And so she's expecting her mom to be like, oh, my God, get out of there, you know. But instead, it seemed like Linda knew that this was going to be expected of her at the party and basically told her, well, do what you have to do. No, Linda. Linda. I take that to mean that she's saying this is how the industry works. You have to you do You have it. to do this. You do not have to do this, Tammy. And she didn't. She left the party. Good. Oh, good for Tammy. Yeah. But according to Debbie, this wasn't the only time this kind of thing happened. It was like Linda was trying to pimp out her own daughter to get 
financial gain. Gross. Again, that is from Anthony Wayne, who was able to talk to Debbie. That's what she told him. We don't know all of the Right. We're not, I mean, we're details. not privy to all of the information. Exactly. Linda Curtis was described by multiple people as a con artist. I th- <laughs> when you said that, I thought you were going to say as a cunt. <laughs> Sorry, nope. I heard the hard C, and I was like, oh, Kate, <laughs> we're going there. She had that company, the modeling company, or whatever you want to call it, Galaxy Productions. <laughs> That's a shitty name. So I looked it up, and it's no longer in existence. Sure. I mean, she's passed I away, should, right. as I mentioned, but right. there is a company in Florida called Galaxy Productions. Oh, it's like an, an event coordinating kind of place, sure. or event planning and I think they're probably fine and not putting... No, no, I'm sorry. I In the context of Linda having a company yeah. named that, I'm sure Galaxy Productions puts on wonderful events. I actually like the name of it. I'm not going to lie. I think she was advertising it as a modeling slash talent agency that also offered acting classes and was going to make your kid a star. She could make your kid a pageant winner and get them commercial work and work in TV and film, sort of like, look at my daughter. This is this was all my doing. And this is one of the oldest scams in the book. Oh, gross. I know where you're going. Yeah. So she wasn't making money. Be- well, I mean, she was conning people. She was conning to people. To get money from them. Exactly. Got you. I think it happens. A- well, it definitely used to happen a lot in the entertainment industry. I think it still does to an extent. What she'd really do was make you give her money for classes or photos or whatever for your kid, but not actually deliver any real results. She'd just pocket that money and spend it on, I don't know, costumes for Tammy? something Fake popping teeth for toddlers. Fake popping teeth for toddlers. Say it three times fast. Fake popping teeth for toddlers. 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 Good job. I did it, Kate. Linda Curtis had a way of bending the truth and embellishing when she felt it could further Tammy's career. Mm -hmm. For example, like I mentioned earlier, she told the Orlando Sentinel that Tammy was going to star in a film called Cover Girl Behind the Scenes. And I'm going to read her statement again just to refresh your memory. She says, quote, Tammy already has a lead role playing herself in a movie called Cover Girl Behind the Scenes. She was cast by Beverly McDermott, who's well known in the industry for movies and a TV series called Careers. It's supposed to start filming within the next six months, I think in Florida. So I intentionally left out the I think in Florida part earlier. Mm -hmm. It was the part that immediately jumped out at me when I read the article because you would know for certain where the filming was to take place. Tammy was 13 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. There is so much paperwork involved if you're going to perform a role on camera. If you have to travel for the role, you're compensated for that. There would be a per diem. All of that would have been worked out before any papers were signed. And especially because she's a minor. And she's a minor, I was just going to say, yeah. So then I did the obvious thing and looked up the film Cover Girl Behind the Scenes. Which, based on my very deep dive of the interwebs... Doesn't exist. Exactly. It doesn't have an IMDb page. It's not listed on Tammy's IMDb page. And I searched the web but could not find anything. So then I looked up Beverly McDermott. Mm -hmm. She was indeed a casting director at that time, and she was based in Florida. But she didn't work on a show called Careers, as Linda stated, and there is no mention of the CoverGirl movie. I would think if Beverly McDermott had learned that her name had been credited in the paper, erroneously, she would have called to correct that, but not necessarily. And who's to say she ever even knew about the article? I also tried to find more info on the perfume that was supposedly going to be named after Tammy, but I couldn't find anything. I think Linda just said things and embellished things to drum up publicity for Tammy. And I also think she had a contact with the local papers, Florida Today and or the Orlando Sentinel, But mainly Florida Today, because it seems a lot of the things reported in these articles are statements made by Linda that are taken at face value without any fact checking. Like the number of titles Tammy won and what movies she was up for. There's a Florida Today article by Billy Cox. The majority of the Florida Today articles are by this guy, Billy Cox. Not all, but most of them. It's dated September 20th, 1995, and it focuses on Linda because she was on her deathbed at that point. Mm. This is 1995. Okay. In the article, Billy writes, quote, 
As owner of Galaxy Productions on Merritt Island, Curtis's track record for turning youngsters into beauty contest and talent show winners, complete with big money incentives, drew reams of national attention during the 1980s, from ABC's 2020 to Life magazine. Um, did it? No. I looked and I could not find anything anything Lies. to corroborate this wait who said that? this is billy cox of florida today and he wrote most of the articles regarding linda and tammy so sh- he was obviously like in linda's pocket i don't know that i can't confirm that speculative all i'm saying is he's the one who wrote most of the articles uh, that's okay. all i can say all right well i'm taking that to mean that you take it however you want it she allegedly no i'm just kidding <laughs> There is no link between 2020 and Galaxy or Life Magazine and Galaxy. Florida Today isn't even a national paper. It's not even a statewide paper. <laughs> it's a local paper. It's on- It only serves Brevard County. While most of the Florida Today articles are centered around Tammy's career in the early 80s, there is one that focuses on another child at that time, a boy named Wing Flanagan, who was 14 at the time this article was written. Wing is an interesting character. Wing. W-I-N-G? W-I-N-G. Not his real name. His real name is John Patrick Flanagan. But at two years old, he informed his parents that his name is Wing. I love it. And Do you, John Patrick. Wing. There you go. Wing man. Winger. I won't go too deep into his backstory, <laughs> but I will tell you that his dad lived in Arizona, and he lived with his mom in Rockledge, Florida. Mm-hmm. Wing had aspirations of becoming a filmmaker and changing the world. And guess who his agent was? Linda. Linda Curtis. Curtis. I almost said Linda Evangelista. <laughs> she wasn't his agent. That makes me think of that Drag Race, uh, drag race episode where they're talking... I think it's Aja is talking to another drag queen and she's like, you're perfect. You're beautiful. You look like Linda Evangelista. You're a model. <laughs> Never seen it. I'll show it to you. In this Florida Today article, writer Billy Cox calls Linda the, quote, critical influence in Wing's career. And Linda states, quote, my goal now is to sit in the front row of the Academy Awards to see that he gets the credit he deserves. Whoa. It should also be noted that Wing was failing ninth grade at the time. (laughs) Kate. (laughs) <laughs> Linda and Tammy actually moved from the mobile home park on Merritt Island mm-hmm. into Wing's family home in Rockledge. What? Why? So here's my thought on that. They were struggling financially, Linda and Tammy. Uh, why? How? I Like, she's conning people for cash. Is it not enough? It's not enough. And Tammy's not making enough either? No. I mean, she hadn't gotten any movie parts yet. She oh, so this is, is pre, only doing like, pageants. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so, and that doesn't bring in that much money when you win them. And no. I'm sure it's a lot of work getting up to the actual pageant. Exactly. Traveling, the costumes, there's a lot of cost involved. And then just basic living expenses. And when your parent is not bringing in that money and it's just the kid, like, it, they just didn't have enough. So they really struggled. It was kind of well known that they were struggling oh, okay. am- amongst their inner circle. Inner circles of people. But she also has this company at this time too, right? Yes. And so she and is Wing Wing's her client. Wing is one of her clients. Mm-hmm. And so she moves into their house. That's so I think she was buddy buddy with his mom. With his mom, okay. And somehow, I mean, there are no real details about how it all transpired. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. It's just a little like, oh wow. It's weird. Yeah. Um don't get me oh, wrong, yeah. it's weird. So Tammy was around three years older than Wing, and their relationship was very much that of a brother and sister. In fact, Linda referred to Wing as her adopted son, even though he wasn't, and Wing's mom, Layla, was alive and well, and it was her house. That's disgusting. Also, Linda has, like, a bunch of other kids. Right. And she's like, screw them. It's so bizarre. And we mean no disrespect. I think there's a lot of family stuff with this case that we simply don't know and aren't privy to. And some of those family members are still living. So we mean no disrespect. This is also a case that has sort of an odd cult following. Oh, strange. And I know that her family is involved. And so I, I don't want to put anything out there that that might not be true or that's just our speculation so i can only tell you what i could find information for one could say 
that Linda took wing under, under her, her wing. wing. There you go. That's my joke. You're welcome, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And you just hear the door shut. And Kate's <laughs> like, I guess I'll finish. <laughs> I guess I'm on my own. So I know that Layla was still living in the house because I found a record online showing that Linda and Layla had gone into business together in September of 1983 in a company they called Spectrum Video Film Incorporated. And that company was involuntarily dissolved in November of the following year. And Layla's address is the Rockledge address where Tammy had last lived. Mm. So I know that it was the four of them in that home. Yeah. In these Florida Today articles, the one on Wing, as well as ones regarding Tammy's career, Mm -hmm. there are two names other than Linda Curtis that are mentioned. Oh, wow. Peter Mills and Walter Leibowitz. Who, Who are they? Both of these men were friends with Linda Curtis. Peter Mills was a forensic dentist. He was actually the Atlanta Crime Lab's chief dental consultant. He also drove a DeLorean and produced horror films. What's None a DeLorean? Of, it's, did you ever see Back to the Future? Yes. It's the car. Oh, okay. I've heard that that yeah. name so many times. I'm like, I don't know what that is. DeLorean was the last name of the guy that like Made invented that, invented that, that car. That car. And in case you didn't catch it, this forensic dentist also produced horror films. Ooh. But I couldn't find any of them on IMDb. Oh. Supposedly, he was very impressed with Wing's cinematic eye and really talks him up in this article. Just a few months before Tammy's disappearance, she was set to play the lead in Peter Mill's upcoming film. At least that's what Billy Cox from Florida Today reported. So there's your connection between Peter Mills with both of them. I see. The other name that comes up in these articles is Walter Leibowitz, another friend of Linda's, as well as the family attorney. He also had a Miami-based communications firm and is quoted in Wing's article as saying, quote, Wing certainly has the potential to make a major contribution. Anything I can do to help him, I'll try to do. And in an article about Tammy, Billy Cox mentions that Tammy made a guest appearance on a show called Money Talks, hosted by Walter Leibowitz. And Leibowitz told the paper, quote, I thought she handled herself great. She was smooth and poised. If Tammy gets the right break through the right vehicle, she could be the star of the future. Did, was that show a real thing? Did that actually happen? I tried to find that show online. I couldn't find it. Is there any record? But I do feel like that is something that could have easily been... A local TV show. Well, I think it could have easily been disputed if it didn't exist. Like if someone were to read that, be like, there is no su- such show. So... I'm sure it was just a local yeah. small thing that's right. not going to have like a huge and presence. And is probably not out there anymore. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's fair. Yeah. But again, it's these two men talking up these two clients of their friend Linda Curtis. Yeah. Walter Leibowitz was a shady character. I was just thinking this is really shady. He once talked one of his own clients, a convicted felon and diagnosed schizophrenic, into stealing an expensive purse from Neiman Marcus to give to his wife. Gah. Leibowitz was also in the <laughs> baby selling business. Can no! You? Sorry. No. And even wrote a book titled How to Sell a Baby? The Baby Seller. Um- <laughs> Can we get copies of this? Well, turns out, never got Everyone published. Everyone was, oh, good. It should not. But he hoped it would one day become a bestseller. It didn't. Leibowitz was eventually disbarred, not for the baby selling. He was actually acquitted of that, seemingly on a technicality. Shut the fuck up. But for possessing stolen property. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, <laughs> he was Linda's good friend. You know. <laughs> He's speechless. Florida Bar Association in the 80s. What the fuck? There's a lot going on. Both Peter Mills and Walter Leibowitz's names appear on the police report, which we'll talk about later. People at police report for what? Tammy. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm getting so into the details. I'm forgetting the bigger picture here. I think we talk about it in part two. Okay, got you, got you. Sorry, I'm forgetting that this is like a long, involved story. It is. Uh, we're just. It's a we're, journey. We're getting the pieces. We're getting the shitties. The shitty the shitties. people. <laughs> Sometimes I get a case of the shitties, and then I'm in bed for a weekend. I ordered Taco Bell last night. And it gave you the shitties? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You bet. (laughs) But when I got on the scale today. You had lost all that weight. You did. (laughs) Just pooped it out. Three or four pounds, girl. (laughs) 
Let's get back to Tammy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, this is very serious. After getting her GED at age 16. Which is amazing. And I fucking love. If she did, in fact, pass. We don't know. It's not confirmed. It oh, says man. that she was exempted from high school because she took her GED test. Because she took it. It doesn't say that she it passed It doesn't say it. the results. Uh, but I I'm see. assuming she passed. I'm assuming she passed. She sounds like a smart girl. Also, I think the state would have to come after you if you, if you just pass. stopped going yeah. to school. Uh, so Tammy wanted to focus more on acting and modeling and leave the pageant world behind. She had a small bit part in the film Little Darlings, which starred Tatum O'Neill and Christy McNichol. I've heard of that. It came out in 1980, and on the Unfound podcast, Anthony Wayne tells a story of how Tatum and Christy were jealous of Tammy because when she was on set, people couldn't take their eyes off of her. She was this beautiful blonde girl. She had a way of getting attention, and the story goes that one day there were press on the set, and Tatum O'Neill ordered that Tammy be removed from the studio premises because she didn't want her getting all the attention. Mm. I don't know Anthony's source for the story, so I don't know how true that is, but it's interesting. I mean, if that happened, that's that sucks. Like, that's rude. Her next film was Spring Break that was shot in Fort Lauderdale in 1982 and released in 1983. Again, it was just another bit part. She played a boxer in a scene. She didn't have any lines. However, according to, quote, an exclusive scoop revealed only to what newspaper, Kevin? Uh, Florida Flo- Chronicle. Florida, the lo- Florida. For- Flor- I'll help you out. <laughs> Florida Today. Helen Cleland, who at that time was the director of national promotions for Columbia Pictures, stated wow. Tammy was the model for the movie's poster. All you see are her hips and stomach, but I'll post the picture. It's kind of, I feel like it's an iconic movie poster because when I saw it, I was like, oh, I know this poster, but I might be making that up. And she was a teenager. Is it like a... Yeah, we're going to get into that. So she would have been a minor at the time that that poster was shot. And... Can I look at it real quick? Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the name of it again? Spring Break. Spring Break movie poster. Ooh, teen... I mean, not ew, but it... Yeah. Sometime after wrapping her role on spring break, Tammy attended a party. And this is where everything in Tammy's world seems to take a turn. Okay. I've not found any information about who was at this party or where it took place. Very little is known about this party. Mm -hmm. But once Tammy returned from it, friends and family said she was never the same. Oh, God. What happened at the party? We don't know. Linda said that after Tammy came home from that party, she was always on edge and paranoid. And when anyone asked her what was wrong, she would just laugh it off and avoid the question. Mm -mm. Eventually, though, Mm -mm. Linda said Tammy finally told her that she had seen something so horrible she was going to get killed for it. What? Yeah. But we don't know what it was. Oh, my God. Tammy was really vague about the details, but mentioned something about drugs and money laundering, according to Linda. What the fuck? I don't know what was going on. Linda said Tammy became really withdrawn during this time, Mm. mostly just keeping to herself in her room and avoiding her friends. She sounds scared. Yeah, she she definitely was. And people around her at the time said that knew it. That fear was genuine. Palpable. One of those friends was Rick Adams. He and Tammy had been really close growing up. He was about two years older than she was. Mm. And it was more than a brother-sister type of relationship, but not a serious romance. It was like somewhere in the middle. In a Florida Today article, Florida Today! Florida Today! (laughs) Dated March 18th, 1990, Mm -hmm. Rick said Tammy could have dated anyone she wanted to, but he thinks perhaps the reason that she was close to him was because he never wanted anything from her. She felt like she could trust him. That's nice. Yeah, there was just like a a comfort there. A kindness where not everyone's just asking you to do something so they can get money from you. And that she wasn't expected to be sexual because that was such a big part of her career and just all of that. She was his date to both his junior and senior proms. Oh, I love it. However, once he graduated college, the two drifted apart. No. Rick said, quote, Tammy had a lot of pressure about her appearance in public because of who she was. Mm -hmm. She felt like she had this image she had to live up to. Everything she did was like fine tooth combed. Her makeup had to be just right. Every hair had to be in place. What she wore had to be perfect. 
It drove me crazy, to tell the truth. I got burned out on the whole thing. With so many people hanging around, so many people coming up to her, it was almost like having to compete for attention, and I wasn't into that. Yeah. However, shortly before she disappeared, Tammy did get back in touch with Rick. She began confiding in him that she thought someone was trying to kill her. And he said her fear was very real. This was not the bubbly Tammy he'd grown up with. She had become a different person. Hmm. But during all this, Tammy was still pursuing her career. She's still working. She landed a bit part in the hugely successful film Scarface. Again, she didn't have any lines, but this was a big deal. It's Al Pacino. It's Michelle Pfeiffer. And although she wouldn't have a lot of screen time, it's an opportunity to make connections. Like, she was going to be on that set. She could have that to put on her resume. Like, I did this movie with... And, and she's kind of in an iconic scene, too. So I was going to say, like, is when you say bit part, was she, like, an extra? Or was she, like, just she's a like non-speaking... A, she's, like, a featured, featured extra. Featured extra, okay. Where it's her and one other person. Oh, wow. So, she, okay. So she plays a young woman in a blue bikini who distracts the lookout guy while Al Pacino is up in a hotel room watching his friend get dismembered by a chainsaw. So if you've seen the movie, that's it's that Jesus scene. Christ. It's one of the most iconic scenes of the movie, and you can watch it on YouTube if that's your jam. The scene was shot in Miami in March of 1983. So she had just turned 18 the previous month. So though technically an adult... She's still a teenager. The guy Tammy's character is flirting with is all over her. He's touching her. At one point, he starts to put his hand down the back of her bikini bottoms, and she moves away. And I'm not sure if that was scripted or not, but when I watched it, it felt like that's a girl who's uncomfortable. I don't know if that was the case or if that was planned. She's underage. No, she's 18. Oh, she's 18 now. She had just turned 18. Oh, my God. Okay. Thank, I'm, I mean, it doesn't make it better. Yeah. But... Still, for a teenage girl, that's a lot. Yeah. And when you think about it, like, you're in a bikini. There are so many crewmen around. Like, you're just in front of all it's these really people. Vulnerable. It is. And you're just exposed. Mm. Since her scene was being shot in Miami, which was about a three-hour drive from Rockledge, she had to stay with the family friend that was based in Miami, baby seller and purse thief Walter Leibowitz. Baby seller and purse thief. <laughs> it's, reported that, it's reported that on her fourth day of filming, Tammy was watching a pretty gory scene where a character gets shot, and that actor was wearing a blood pack. And when the blood pack exploded, Tammy freaked out. <gasps> She became hysterical. She could not calm down and had to be escorted back to her trailer. This incident is discussed in the Unsolved Mysteries episode about this case. We'll talk about that episode more in a... We'll, we'll actually talk about it in part two. Oh, Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm. I have not... that. So I like the reboot, but when I was a kid and I used to watch that show, it scared the shit out of me. That music? Ugh. We're going to do a little dive into the, the particular Unsolved Mysteries episode about Tammy. Should I watch it before we record the next episode? You don't necessarily have to because okay. the majority of the things we're going to talk about are what was going on behind the scenes of that episode. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The one who's describing this incident in the Unsolved Mysteries episode is none other than... Walter Leibowitz. I just imagine he's like on the street with like babies in designer purses like get your babies get your babies in purses. <laughs> oh my god. He said that the casting director called him since he was her point of contact and told him that Tammy was crying and needed to come down to set mm -hmm. which I'm not sure why the, it would be the casting director that calls but I don't I don't know the specifics. So Leibowitz goes to Tammy in her trailer and according to him Tammy kept saying over and over, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. He said, quote, she was in a tremendous state of fear, anxiety, saying something about money laundering. The party. Tammy quit the film. Whoa. In Unsolved Mysteries, they say she quit. But I also think it's possible that was her last day and she was just done filming that role. I mean, was that character going to have any other screen time? So I've read that there was supposed to be another part with her that was recast with another actress oh. because she quit. But also it's a very small role. So I can't imagine it would even take more than four days to shoot. Scarface does appear on her IMD page. So... I don't know if another part of that movie was supposed to feature her, like I said, but she is in the movie. She did have one more acting job that year. 
her first speaking role in the film Video Wars. She plays a character named Magda. The entire movie is on YouTube. It is unbelievably bad. But I am going to link it because you can see Tammy (laughs) in action actually speaking. Leibowitz encouraged Linda to take Tammy down to the police station since she was saying someone was trying to kill her. He was like, you might want to get to the bottom of that, see what's going on there. I can't do anything for you because I'm busy selling babies, but you should get on that. Leibowitz is like, all right, honey. Linda claimed that she did take Tammy. 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 Linda claimed that she did take Tammy down to talk to the sheriff, and Tammy filed a report. But investigators that worked on Tammy's case said they have no record of that report. Back at home, Tammy began refusing to eat food on her plate because she thought someone was trying to poison her. Yeah. So she'd be sitting next to Wing at the dinner table and offer him food off her plate and be like, eat this. Like she was testing to see if anything would happen to him if he did. Wing said she had good days and bad days. Some days she was almost like her old self, but other days she was real edgy. Things came to a head on July 1st, 1983. Mm -hmm. Tammy got upset with Wing for something or other and Mm -hmm. runs outside. But the front door closed behind her. And when she tried to get back in, it was locked. locked. So she starts to freak out, almost like a panic attack. Man. Randomly, there was a baseball bat nearby. I'm guessing it was probably Wings. So she picks it up and smashes the window in. Oh, my God. Tammy. Wing comes out kind of like, what the fuck is going on? And she accused him of locking her out of the house, which he hadn't done. The lock on the doorknob was just locked when the door closed. Yeah. Tammy then started to attack Wing. With the bat? Yes. Oh, my God. And this was the last straw for Linda. She said she didn't recognize her daughter anymore. Something is going on. Sorry to interrupt, but, like, something is is really wrong. Yeah. And Linda said that she had her admitted to a hospital under the Baker Act. The Baker Act is a Florida law that allows family members to admit loved ones involuntarily if they feel that person's mental health is endangering them and others. Mm. So against Tammy's wishes, Linda checked Tammy into a mental health care facility for a physical and psychiatric evaluation. I mean, I know that sucks for Tammy, but if you're feeling so paranoid and scared and it's affecting your life in such a negative way, I, I can see why her mom would have done this. I do. Under, yeah, I do understand it, especially when you are attacking other people in your home. Yeah, that's a little far. Yeah. Tammy stayed 72 hours, which is the maximum amount of time allowed under the Baker Act, okay. unless further treatment is required. And she consents to it? To stay longer. Yeah. I don't know that he, she even has to consent under that act if they say that she needs She needs treatment. more than 72 hours. Got you. She was examined by Dr. Barry L. Hensel, Ph.D. No drugs or alcohol were found in her system. And according to her friend Rick Adams, she never drank or did drugs. So they were able to quickly rule out substance abuse as a cause for her erratic behavior. And while she was at this facility, she reportedly didn't display any signs of aggressive behavior or behavior that would be considered out of the ordinary. There is another test that might or might not have been performed while she was at this facility. Mm -hmm. A pregnancy test. Really? And I say might or might not because Tammy's half-sister Suzanne says both a blood and urine test were performed and both came back positive. And indicated that Tammy was about three months pregnant. Whoa. However, this has not been corroborated. corroborated. And remember, Suzanne was a sister that never met Tammy. But she has kept an online presence in efforts to find out what happened to her. Sure. Debbie, the sister that lived with Tammy growing up, doubts that Tammy was pregnant because Tammy had called her shortly before she went missing, asking to come live with her. Debbie lived in California at the time and said that Tammy had mentioned to her she was pursuing film work out there and wanted to know if she could stay with her. Debbie said if Tammy were pregnant, she would have told her. But would she? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about their relationship. Exactly. Well, and even so, we wouldn't know. Yeah. According to Suzanne, the doctor informed Linda of the pregnancy test results, which really upset Tammy because she didn't want her mom to know. And if she was pregnant, I could see why she wouldn't want to tell Linda because she was probably afraid of the repercussions, given that Tammy was Linda's source of income and that income relied on Tammy's looks and her availability. And a baby would certainly interfere with all of that. Mm -hmm. 
This was several years before HIPAA was enacted. HIPAA went into effect in 1996. But even so, Tammy was 18 when she was in that care facility. So mm-hmm. I don't know how the doctor could legally inform her mom she was pregnant unless that's part of the Baker Act that your parent has a right to all that information. I tried looking that up, but I couldn't find the answer to that. Weird. Okay. With doctors finding no reason that Tammy should need further medical care, she was released. Shortly after, she called up her friend Rick Adams. They met up on the evening of July 5th, 1983, the night before she went missing. Mm -hmm. The two went to a church where they prayed together. Rick said that Tammy told him she'd seen something she shouldn't have, though she didn't give details. But he said she was genuinely scared. At the same time, she was furious with her mom for having her baker acted. If the relationship between her and Linda was strained before, it was nearly broken Mm, at this point. Yikes. Rick said Tammy cried harder than he'd ever seen anyone cry in their life. Oh my God. After they talked, Rick dropped her off at her house around 11 p.m., but they made plans to see each other again the next day. Rick said they were going to go back to the church Wednesday afternoon, and she told him, I just want you to know that I might have to go away for a while, but I also want you to know that I love you. The next day, Rick called to confirm their plans to meet up. But by then, Tammy Lynn Leppert had vanished. And that's where we're going to end part one. Oh, God. Cliffhanger. In part two, we'll get into Tammy's friend, Keith Roberts, who she called to pick her up that Wednesday morning. We're going to talk about a couple of serial killers that were in the area around that time. We're going to go over the Unsolved Mysteries episode, more specifically what was happening behind the scenes of that episode, because it's very interesting. Whoa. And we're going to talk about why Tammy may or may not have had multiple social security numbers. What? And we're going to discuss the fact that Tammy's mom, Linda, waited five days before filing a missing persons report. Oh, Kate, I don't like this at all. It's weird. I still don't know what I think. Okay, and there are no concrete answers to this. No, nothing. But I'm going to try to give you everything that's out there. To piece together what we think might have happened, could have happened. Yeah, I have ideas, but once I delve more into part two, maybe I'll be able to firm those up a little bit. Or firm them up, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. Okay. Let us know your thoughts in the comments on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at... Horrorwood Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email at... Horrorwood Podcast at gmail.com. And if you're feeling so inclined, you can be like James Harrington and James join Harrington. the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Horrorwood Podcast. That's it.